Hey there beautiful people, my name is Chris Jones and I'm going to be introducing today's episode of Meet the Scientists for COP26.tv and I'm with Professor Carol Wagstaff, um, Research Dean for Agriculture, Food and Health for University of Reading and Co-Director for Horticulture Quality and Food Loss Network. Welcome Carol. Thank you very much, it's great to be here Chris. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm really, really excited about um, what you have to say because, you know, essentially it looks like a lot of your research maybe focuses around the solutions and around food security, which is uh, an incredibly f important topic. So um, would you be able to tell me, a just give me a, a sort of summary of the current research that you're doing at the moment? So the research in our group at the University of Reading really focuses on horticultural crops and we're interested in the food systems that supply those crops and ultimately how they're perceived by the consumer um, and trying to ensure that the consumer has access to plenty of, of fresh fruit and veg. But we also look at ways of, of processing fruit and veg so that um, it can be accessible to everyone. Um, and people have um, the opportunity to eat a, a healthy and sustainable diet um, through a variety of means. So we're mostly focused on, on crops that we consume in the UK, but of course we have to recognise that our supply chains may start from outside the UK as well. Um, and so we, we look at different aspects. Um, so we do look at crops that are grown overseas. Um, but we also look at how we can start to produce more of the food that's consumed in the UK on our own shores. Um, and climate change is, is one of the things that's really challenging in, in both scenarios that we're trying to deal with. Fantastic. So, so food security, food networks and, and obviously um, growing as well. And, and and also food longevity. So there's quite a few different different things that I'd quite like to, to cover and, and discuss with you today. Um, I guess the um, if if we talk about um, the f sort of food networks and food distribution, because that's that's quite a critical thing. Um, thinking thinking globally, um, what what can you tell me about sort of the climate change's impact? on or potential impact on, on food networks? So clearly food trans or the transport of food has a huge impact on climate change. Traditionally, it's involved um, petrochemically driven vehicles, um, or, you know, transporting food by air um, and so on. And of those, sea freight is more climate friendly. Um, clearly that involves long distances as well. I mean, we have a huge challenge in that on one hand, we're encouraged to, to eat a wide diversity of fruit and vegetables um, to, to meet our five a day target. And on the other hand, um, we want to minimise the, the food supply chains as much as possible um, and to, to reduce the use of those fossil fuels to distribute our food. And I think the reality is, is that we need to get smarter about how we transport our food. Um, clearly, it's good if we can reduce the length of those supply chains as well, um, that we can make them more agile and more flexible. But we need to be less reliant on fossil fuels as a form of transport. We need to make sure that if we're sending a vessel of any description out to collect food from somewhere, that it goes out full, that it, we don't send out something empty and it comes back with food, um, that we get better at, at using transport in more flexible ways. Um, and that we, we're we a bit more intelligent about how we produce our food. So there's often a debate in, in terms of convenience foods, um, you know, the sorts of things that you might buy from a, a garage or something like um, ready chopped up pineapple. It's, it's you know, great, it's convenient. You can even eat it in the car as you go along and it's, it's better for you than a bar of chocolate. Um, but do you ship that pineapple to the UK and then chop it um, and Typically, the cost of labour is much higher in, if you do that in the UK, um, but the carbon footprint of putting it on a boat is much lower than if you do the opposite thing, which is that you cut it at the point of, of where it's grown and then you fly in. Because once it's cut, it's cut up, of course, it becomes far more vulnerable. Um, and so, yeah, this idea about ship and cut or cut and fly is quite a real debate. And at the moment, there's a lot of cut and fly because the labour costs overseas, 
where these tropical fruits are grown is so much less. Um, whereas actually from a, a sort of climate change perspective, we'd probably be better off doing um, ship and cut. I mean, there are, is the argument, should we be eating pineapple? But, you know, we want to try and get people eating fruit and veg in all sorts of forms and recognising that not everyone has time and opportunity to, to prep everything from scratch. And pineapple is a fairly luxury item, but, you know, the principle of it, of, as to where food's coming from, and also the sort of the consideration of the, the economic value it has in the community where it is grown, um, that we are, we're, I believe we're part of a global community. And so if we start saying we're going to retract um, our consumption only to things that we grow in a very local area, um, that might impact on the diversity of food that we can eat. But it also um, impacts on the livelihoods of others, other communities around the world um, and not always positively. Um, so that it's a very complex situation. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't think there's a simple answer, but there are things that we can do or directions that we can take that we say, actually, we put the, the, the carbon footprint um, and the impacts on climate of how we grow the crops, how we transport the crops, how we process the crops, much higher up the agenda of decision making, if we possibly mm. can. So if you had, if, if, if there was someone that had the opportunity to... Um, you know, they, they were maybe more financially well off and therefore they have the time and to, to do some of the, the more um, laborious preparation things. Um, what what would the advice be? And, and obviously we can tailor that to, to maybe someone that doesn't have those opportunities to, to think about how do I change and transform my life? Um, yeah. So if you can eat seasonally and locally, that's great. Um, I'm living on the Hampshire Berkshire borders and we're very fortunate in this, this part of the UK is that it's a pretty good growing environment for, for much of the year. Even so, if you're looking in sort of February, March time, actually trying to eat five different plant families a day is quite challenging. Um, you know, people might say, oh, we can get British apples um, at that time of year, but those apples were harvested in the autumn. Um, you know, this is apple season now. And they are then stored in cold temperatures and high CO2 in order to give them the longevity. And that's why you can get a British apple in, in March, April um, time. And actually the carbon footprint of doing that is, is not necessarily great. Um, there, there was some research um, a few years ago that, that showed that the carbon footprint of an apple consumed in the UK, but grown in New Zealand when it was in season in New Zealand actually had a lower carbon footprint the one that was stored in the UK for six months of the year, which is counterintuitive. And that's why these, these things are never that simple. Um, if you live in a different part of the UK, um, maybe you're living um, in imagine mid Wales or, or um, up in the mountainous regions of Scotland, it's pretty hard to get a tractor up the hills there um, and to say, oh, we should be growing fruit and veg and arable crops in those parts. That's why sheep farming is um, is appropriate for that region, because the, the sheep can go up places where the tractors can't. Um, and so we have to be a bit more nuanced about what we regard as local and seasonal for that matter. Um, and perhaps recognise that although we should consume um, locally and seasonally where possible, um, it's not necessarily something that we can just do everywhere all of the time, that we need a little bit more nuance. Mm. I'm quite interested in in that comment about land and being able to to grow, you know. So so certain crops may be difficult to grow, but yet you might have animals that can take advantage of that land. Um, I'm just wondering, with regard to like food security, how a plant based diet kind of comes into the narrative. Absolutely, um, and and I think the advice I would give is if you want to be vegetarian or vegan that's great um, and those diets can have a real advantage um, in terms of the security of the planet i don't think all meat is bad meat um, i think what i would promote is a plant forward diet um, and recognize that people do want to eat meat in many situations but we should be more considerate about the quality and the provenance of the meat that we're eating um, so plant forward, what, what, what do you mean by that? 
So I mean um, that more of your diet is plant-based, but that if you do eat meat, it's high welfare, it's produced in an environmentally considerate way. For example, it is grown in areas where you can't grow the crops. Um, and equally, I think if you're pursuing a vegan or a vegetarian diet, then you need to be aware of the um, energy costs um, and the environmental costs of producing some of those food products. So if we're sitting in the UK, but we're consuming almond milk that was produced in California, that's got a lousy carbon footprint or a lousy environmental footprint because almond trees um, need a huge amount of water. Um, they grow in California where there's a huge water deficit and drought issues. And so it's not a particularly environmentally considerate option um, to be drinking almond milk in the UK. However, we have quite a big oat growing industry in the UK, particularly up in Scotland. And so oat based milks um, are probably a much better option if you wish to pursue a plant-based diet.